Hello everyone, I'm Phil Rivers. Uh, I'm here to present my paper, Dates and Dispersions, examining the spatiotemporal boundaries of the Guarani expansion to the La Plata Basin with Monte Carlo methods. Um, for those of you who don't know what the Guarani expansion is or where the La Plata Basin is exactly, I'll, I'll clarify that in a second. I'm presenting this research with Fabio Silva, who um, Steph just mentioned won't be able to make it. Um, so, moving along. We initiated this research basically to start placing some harder boundaries on when a certain expansion process was inferred to have taken place, or is inferred to have taken place, into, from Amazonia to the La Plata Basin, eventually arriving at the mouth of the La Plata, where modern day, more or less where modern-day Buenos Aires is located. Um, over time, that morphed into a more critical look at the data itself that was available to us, and which can be summarized as this research question. Can the current body of absolute dates for the Guarani culture adequately explain its pre-contact distribution in terms of an expansion process? So rather than looking at dates themselves, questioning whether these dates actually show what, what people have said they show. So I'm going to go into a little bit of the historical background behind the Guarani culture, how it's defined, how, well, how it was defined, how it's presently understood, both in terms of uh, historical linguistics and um, a little bit of ethnography as well as uh, its, its archaeological definition. Uh, Tupi, as you can see, is, uh, Tupi Guarani is hyphenated. Tupi Guarani is not. Um, and that depends whether you're talking about historical uh, linguistics or, or archaeology. Uh, I'm going to go into, into some of the main paradigms and models that have been proposed to explain the Guarani expansion. Um, and then go over the La Plata uh, C14 and AMS data that is, uh, I'm sorry, AMS, um, thermoluminescence <laughs> data that is available to us and upon which we have based our, our quantile regression, which is the method we have, we have used to model the relationship between an inferred um, origin of the dispersal and, dis and, uh, and time. And then I'm going to move into some results and discussion to wrap it all up. So Tupi Guarani hyphenated is the large a large language family, one of the largest language family within the kind of the overall Tupi stock. Um, as understood by linguists, the origins, the Urheimat of, uh, of, of the old Tupi language family is somewhere in the region of the Madeira, upper Madeira River that straddles the border between what is today, Colum um, sorry, what is today Bolivia and, and uh, central Brazil. Now, the first Portuguese explorers to arrive on the east coast of Brazil in the 15th and 16th centuries noticed something rather strange. As they were, as they were moving from north to south, from the equatorial regions all the way down to where today Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo are located, they were able to communicate just as well, or almost as well, with people living way down in the south as with those almost by the mouth of the Amazon. This was later capitalized on by uh, Jesuit missionaries and other missionaries uh, establishing missions in lowland South America um, by synthesizing the native languages, the obviously highly related native languages, and making them into what became known as the lingua geral, the, the general language which was spoken, which was the lingua franca, lingua geral is the lingua franca, <laughs> you heard me right, in, um, in uh, uh, missions across the South American continent. Um, but an explanation for this wasn't really thought of until, wasn't, they didn't try to explain this, nobody tried to explain this until um, the 19th century, when anthropologists, ethnologists, linguists tried to search for uh, an origin for where all of these culturally, linguistically uh, related groups may have originally come from. So, I'm not going to talk about the Western Tupi languages today, uh, nor am I going to talk about the other seven languages in, in the Eastern. This is very simplified, by the way, it's super simplified. Um, I'm not going to talk about the other seven languages in the Eastern Tupi stock. What I'm focusing on today is simply the Guarani part of the Tupi Guarani, which, so green in green is the Tupi part of that, of that group of languages. I'm focusing on the G, the purple, which uh, 
that's sort of the, the more or less the, 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 the contact, contact era uh, distribution of, of uh, the Guarani language family. Now, moving away from linguistics for a bit, the Tupi Guarani archaeological culture, one word, no hyphen, is what archaeologists have used to, to talk about the, 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 the distribution in space and time of Tupi Guarani speaking peoples. Um, across this huge area, the, the area I showed in the, in the previous map, material culture, settlement patterns, land use patterns are incredibly homo homogenous um, in Tupi Guarani sites. In fact, the only way you can tell the difference between um, between um, Tupi, the Tupi Namba, um, co coastal, co coastal uh, Tupi Guarani populations, and the inland Guarani populations, the only way you can tell the difference between them in the archaeological record is based on the analysis of whole vessel shapes, because they all make the same type of corrugated pottery, they all make the same type of, of, uh, of, of uh, painted pottery, and also the same type of, of uh, brushed pottery. You need the whole vessel to be able to, to tell the small differences that exist between them. Um, Moreover, they used to have similar settlement patterns. They, they, uh, they uh, had large nucleated settlements uh, which were occupied, occupied for long, long periods of time, morphed into cemeteries in some cases, and uh, are responsible in part for creating, uh, you may have heard of the Terra Preta do Indio, the, or the, the, the Amazonian dark earths, anthropogenic dark earths. In large part in the La Plata Basin, these are caused by the, the long-term inhabitation of the of um, of the uh, uh, of specific environments, usually riverine settings, by 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 uh, Tupi Guarani groups. So, the main archaeological models that have been proposed to explain the dispersal of the Guarani or the expansion, as this preferred term now it is, uh, into the La Plata Basin, which is composed of the Paraná and the Paraguay river catchments, to that together coming to form the La Plata at the mouth at the mouth there by, by, between Montevideo and Buenos Aires. Sorry, the main, the main model was, the, the kind of the paradigmatic model was proposed by José Brochalo in, in uh, working with Donald Lathrop in, in the University of Illinois in the late 1980s. And based on the little radiocarbon data that was available to him at the time, plus a heroic effort at synthesizing an incredible amount of data uh, over a huge area, this, this, the map A, is just half of his conclusions, because he did it for the Tupi as well. Um, but for the Guar Guarani, this is more or less what he proposed, sort of a, um, the, the dotted line beginning, beginning um, in the center of Paraguay there, in the north, northwest of the map, is, is kind of his, his inferred proposed expansion route, and then where the, where the arrows become solid um, is where, based on his data, he's, he's, he suggested, while well, they moved through the upper Paraná into um, into, you know, so along the southern escarpment of the southern Brazilian highlands, eventually arriving at the coast, and eventually arriving at, at the, the, the delta or the mouth of the Rio de la Plata. So far, so good. Um, and he assigned various, various timings for, for these expansions, the, for, for this expansion, various bursts of, of, of movement. More recently, last year, another team from, from uh, the University of Buenos Aires took advantage of a much larger corpus of radiocarbon data that has been produced since, uh, radiocarbon and thermoluminescence data, that has been produced since the 80s and kind of modified uh, Brochado's hypothesis um, because it, it was that after all and, and he frames it as a hypothesis, not necessarily as, as something that, that's, that should be taken as gospel, gospel truth, but in the, over time kind of has morphed into that. Um, and they, they, they're a little bit more agnostic about, the, about the, the, the exact origin, preferring instead to, I mean, it's a different way of saying the same thing, basically, but where he has the dotted arrow, they, have, they propose an, an early area where more research is needed, right? It's the safest conclusion of any research ever, is that we need more research. Okay, good. Um, and they modified a little bit in terms of the exact timing of pulses. They proposed several hiatuses where they, have, though they say that there are, there are gaps in the record, um, et cetera. So just to describe that, the data, this is their, this is their data. They, they were very, very nice to publish the, the data that they based their conclusions on, um, not in the form of supplementary material, which would have been more useful, but, into, but as I think about seven or eight pages of, of tables in a rather short article. But anyway, um, 
that was fun to copy and paste, let me tell you. <laughs> so uh, we have in total 144 uh, C14 and AMS dates. The distinction is important, and I'll, t I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you why in a second. For it has, it has, uh, has consequences for, for our conclusions. And 103 thermoluminescence dates. I've chosen to visualize them just so you can see the overall distribution of, of where TL dating was used and where C14 dating, dating was used more in, more in, uh, in, in Brazil. Because at one point, the University of Sao Paulo got a shiny new thermoluminescence lab and, and wanted to use it a lot. Um, the data spans five Brazilian states, uh, one, uh, sorry, four Argentinian provinces, and bits and pieces of, of Uruguay, mainly along the Uruguay uh, River. Um, and the oldest site that we have is right on the edge of the of the um, of the, uh, the sort of the, the entry point where the, the where Bonomo et al. proposed the, the, the early area. Um, it's the Fazenda Dona Carlota site. It uh, dated to 2000, um, 2010 uh, BP plus minus 75. Uh, radiocarbon years. And this is effectively a summary of 40 years of research in, in, in the region. Uh, they synthesize an incredible amount of data related to, uh, to uh, Guarani sites. And not all of them have been dated. In fact, of these 247 dates, I think that's less than 10% of the total known Guarani sites in the La Plata Basin. So it's, it's already quite a small sample. So now I'm going to show you an animation, short animation, where we've uh, we calibrated the, this data um, and, and uh, placed the sites into 100-year bins. So beginning at, um, I think, the, the Dona Carlota site is just, just on the other side of, of the BC-AD AD divide. Um, so beginning in 100, to 100 BC to the years, year, year one, and then moving up in 100-year bins like that. So very few sites at first. And then suddenly you're going to see a very big growth. Eventually they make it to, there's the expansion, eventually they make it to the mouth of the La Plata before there's a very sharp decline in sites, as you can imagine, as the, the uh, Europeans start having a greater and greater impact on native society. Um, sort of completely disappearing by the 18th century, which makes sense as well because you can't radiocarbon date stuff that's too, that's too young very effectively. Um, this is the unsorted data. These are calibrated, calibrated ages, BP, um, but un unsorted. The, the x-axis is just, uh, is just the, the, the number in, in our database. Um, but we, choose, we, we chose to model our origin as the Fazenda Dona Carlota site um, because it is the earliest date uh, that we have and it's also right next to the inferred early area. I lost my notes here. So now I'm, this, is the, this is the data sorted by the distance from the Fazenda Dona Carlota site. The, I'm just going to call it the Fazenda site because that's a mouthful. So a distance zero and age about zero, calibrated age about zero, because um, 2000 BP. Um, that's the origin. I should have symbolized it better with a star or something so you can see it better. But it's not hugely intuitive what's going on here. There are some older dates that are really far away. For, uh, yeah, some older dates are really far away. Some young dates which are really close to, to the Fazenda Dona Carlota. So as in previous studies of expansion processes, we have chosen to use a uh, quantile regression on this data um, to model the relationship between early Guarani dates as a dependent variable and each site's distance from the proposed origin, the Fazenda site, as the covariate. Um, whereas ordinary least squares of regression um, approximates to the conditional mean of a data set, quantile regression uh, approximates to a given quantile, a chosen quantile um, of the dependent variable, uh, the median being the 50th quantile, quantiles being splitting data sets into, into equal sizes. So given that an archaeological data set, such as the present one, is bound to include dates that don't correspond to the first arrival of the dispersal process being studied, regressing to the mean doesn't always yield the most useful or parsimonious relationship to the, to the, uh, the, the data, um, particularly when we use this for inference. Uh, it's also advantageous over, thing, over approaches like data filtering, so, you know, selecting a subsample of the, of the data, and, um, or uh, weighted regression, uh, in that you don't have to use a subsample of the data with, with uh, quantile regression, and also you don't have to kind of feel out a reasonable weighting of the data 
um, with it either. Um, so it's, it's, it's a robust alternative to, to normal regression techniques. Um, so what we did is, this is really small. Okay, so we sampled the data 50,000 times, uh, sampled the distribution of, of calibrated data 50,000 times, and we regressed to the first percentile, you know, corresponding to a very early um, arrival in each region as you move far away from the, from the proposed origin. Um, one thing I'd like, to, you know, like you to note is the flat and, and, um, the flat and um, negative regression lines, which the, the flat ones imply that, that there was no dispersal, they just kind of appeared out of thin air, and um, the, the negative ones, which implies they actually dispersed in the other direction, um, sort of from the coast to the Fazenda site. Um, uh, the, uh, but that, that, that's a very, very small percentage of the data, but it's interesting to note nonetheless. Um, it's a premonition of things to come. So these, the, these are histograms of the, the, um, uh, the intercept and the slope of these regressions. Uh, and the blue envelopes are confidence intervals. So what we did here is to gain some idea of the significance of our regression is we created a thousand mock data sets uh, by random sampling without replacement of the distribution of distances. Um, and we did the same for the cal uncalibrated C14 dates and their associated standard deviations, which we then calibrated. We did 10,000 picks on each of the Monte Carlo picks on each of the, of the mock data sets and performed each of the thousand mock data sets and performed regressions on those. That that's equals to that equals um, ten million regressions from which we extracted a comfort, a ninety five percent confidence interval, and that's how we produce these envelopes. So anything outside, or sorry, anything within those confidence envelopes is not significant. It doesn't explain anything. It's no difference from no structure in the data. So the only the only and notably the the. The most, the most common, the, mo the mode and the median of the, the, both the, the start date for the expansion and for its speed are non, in fact, the, sorry, the speed, the slope are non-significant. You cannot infer a dispersal process from, from, the, from the data. And pretty much, that's the big conclusion. We compared this to the Pinhasi date for the spread of the European Neolithic and it's, it's completely different, it, you know, it's very, it's very, this is the standard data set for modeling the Neolithic expansion into, from, from the Near East to, to Europe, and it's, it's, uh, it shows, shows something rather different. Um, yeah, so to try and improve upon this, you can see the p-values there as well. To try and improve upon this, we also, also use a cost distance model. As I mentioned, the Guarani preferred riverine environments, and that's probably the, the, main, the main routes along which they traveled to, uh, to uh, disperse into, into the region. So you, again, using the, the Fazenda site as a, as, a, as a point of origin, we uh, constructed a cost surface in which we assumed move by river was um, five times more efficient than, than um, or five times less costly than moving uh, by land. And did exactly what I said, all over again. So that's the two, the two histograms on the side there, and they actually performed worse. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 P, the P values are, uh, are, uh, are even worse. So, which, which was interesting because rivers are always so emphasized in interpretations of how the Guarani moved, how they lived, what they did. Uh, it's, it's actually, it was actually really surprising to find out that we went through all this effort and, and it amounted to to a worse model, but at least we could say that, that we, we did it. So could we model it, as I just said? No, but why? Uh, huge temporal and geographical gaps in this, in this data. There's nothing for the, for the lower, lower Paraná, just the mouth, sorry, lo, the lower La Plata, just the, mouth, just the mouth of it, and then the upper, the upper La Plata. Nothing in Paraguay. If in the modern day in Latin America, you, you uh, or say Argentina or um, Uruguay, southern Brazil, you say, ah, he's a Guarani, people automatically think he's Paraguayan. There are so many Paraguayans and Guarani, it's the official language of the country, but yet no archaeological research on the pre-Columbian occupation of Paraguay has taken place. Virtually nothing. It's all mission period and afterwards. So 
That also corresponds to the early area, and we have no dates from there, nor from uh, for between Bolivia and, and southern Brazil. Uh, it also has to do with the size of the study area and the data quality. Now, these two, these two things are, are intimately related. And I'd like to highlight some work by Hazelwood and Steele all the way back in 2004, where I swear this is the only equation I have. But so in their Fisher scale, they use Fisher scale, uh, the Fisher scale model of, um, uh, of wave fronts to, to um, model the speed and timing of a wave front, of an expansion wave front in the archaeological record based on radiocarbon dates. And all I want to say about this is the V error all the way, all the way over there, the, stand, the standard error in, in the velocity increases when the change in distance is small. That makes sense, right? The, the divisor is small, the standard error is large, which it is. In some cases, the radiocarbon dates are, uh, sorry, am I, have to, am I having to stop? I'm, this is my no, last no, slide. Okay. Um, in some cases, the, radiocarbon, the, the error in the radiocarbon dates is, is on the order of centuries, 200 years in some cases also in the, in the thermoluminescence data. It's, it's, it, but that's part, partially because when they were made, all the way back in the 60s uh, and into the modern day, the, 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 the modern radio carbon data is far higher quality, but because we chose to use everything, this messy data uh, kind of screws things up. Because it's a small area, large errors, there you go. Uh, we also have to question this kind of notion that pots are people that the Guarani were the only people making to be Guarani pottery. Now, this is, that's a completely different paper altogether, but I'm just going to highlight it here because I'm out of time. And we also have to think about the fact that there may be multiple processes at play. It's not simply the Guarani being the imperialists of the Amazon and you know, establishing a village, expanding the population, boom, next village, boom, next village, boom, next village, down, down the line. Um, there may be an acculturation at play, um, interbreeding, uh, sorry, interbreeding, inter intermarriage, other processes. It wasn't simply them diffusing into an empty space. And that's where I'm going to leave it for now. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.